I feel like we keep doing ourselves a disservice by limiting intimacy is only sex. Intimacy is only spending time together. Like, no. I need her to know you. And I need to be known by you. I know you've heard it before, like the whole into me see. I need you to say, everybody do that. If, if you've been to church and, been a, and, and, and heard of marriage, sir, you really, really, truly need to ask yourself, why do I want to be married? What what is is this really for me? I knew before I got married. I didn't I never I never required it. I would have never cared if I never got married. And so that should have been an indicator for me that it's not something that I should seriously pursue because it's easy to have the mentality like I don't need you anyway when you really feel like I didn't want to be in this. Sabrina, welcome back. How are you doing? Thank you. I'm great. I'm thankful. I've, I'm, my life is doing a lot of great things that I'm excited about. I'm, I'm, I'm just it's full of gratitude. And I'm happy to be here, for sure, again. Again. We're going to knock this one out the park because this is a, a series I'm very excited about and it's been going really well. I want to jump into this so that way I can respect your time. How did you and your ex-spouse meet? Give us a short version, but how did y'all meet? So there is a Christian organization here in Chicago um, called Legacy, and they would host this yearly conference uh, called the Legacy Conference. It's a discipleship conference. And I had been going to that conference since I was a young girl, so 15 years old back in 2007. Um, and so the year was 2012, back again from Carlton College at the conference, serving, doing my thing. And I guess this boy saw me. And he asked a couple people who he had seen around me who I was. And um, on the night of the second day of the conference, he asked me for my number and told me that somebody had like sent him my way because he was going to school in Nashville and that I currently lived in Nashville. Which at the time I did, I was in college in Nashville, finished up my sophomore year. He was on his way to law school in Nashville. So, yeah, we uh, we met at the conference and I didn't think anything of it. I'm just like, oh, he's coming to Nashville. He's looking for a community. So cool. I'll be able to show him around. And we ended up going to church together a few times. And- yeah, it was just an instant friendship move. Mm, yeah, for sure. So at what point did you say, this is the man for me? Now, that story is a little bit more complicated because growing up in the Christian ethic, and specifically the part of Christianity that we were in, it was very like, especially at this age where young adults almost, you know, I'm getting out of college. He's out of college. So anytime you're around somebody of the opposite sex, it feels like, are you going to marry them? Are you going to marry them? Are you going to marry them? Is that your husband? Is that your wife? Is that your wife? Is that your husband? And so it's, there's always this pressure to uh, examine your relationships in the context of, if this is not your husband, if this is not your wife, you shouldn't be spending all this alone time. However, he and I are in a city far from home. And... He doesn't know anybody else but me and the people he goes to school with who don't necessarily share his faith in the way that I do. And even though I had been in Nashville for years, I had not yet found people who understood my theological convictions the way that he was growing into. So, of course, we were spending a lot of time together. We went on a couple of dates, of course. Um, but we were going to church together pretty much every Sunday. And... Just the more I looked at him and I just thought about like, if I wanted to be married, does he check the boxes and the answers at, at least externally were yes, 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 yes. Um, and then some of the things that I saw internally, like I remember one time we went on a date and uh, we were at a Mexican restaurant and a, uh, a house man walked into the restaurant and was asking for money for food. And he just got up and bought him a meal, right? Um, I think he might've gave him a couple of dollars too. And generosity is just such a huge, like, 
for me, having a heart for people and kind of demonstrating that in that moment. Um, and that's really cool. He, like, he did a lot of that. That was the only time he's ever helped people um, who needed it. So that was the first moment in a while. I was like, wait a minute. I like you. You're, you're <laughs> like, he was already cute and Christian and very intelligent and very accomplished. All that's good. But like, like when I saw something from the inside, I was just like, wait a minute. I, okay. Um, and so very uh, soon he reached out to me, well, not reached out, but he communicated to me that he had intentions to pursue me, which is the language that is used in the courtship. <sighs> Whatever. He had intentions to pursue me uh, to be in a relationship. And I told him to let me pray about it for 30 days. And I thought I prayed about it for 30 days. And I felt like I told the Lord, I felt like the Lord had told me, yes, we can be in a relationship. So somewhere around Christmas 2012, I was like, yeah, um, I like you, but I feel like, you know, I got to hear a yes from God. That was what I thought is <laughs> supposed to how, how I thought it was supposed to be. And I thought I did. So, mm. yeah. for sure. Did, did you both do premarital counseling? We did. We sure did. We, and we actually did premarital counseling with. The couple who's basically responsible for us meeting. <laughs> um, but, you know, they lived in Chicago. We lived in Nashville. So it was long distance premier counseling. Um, we still know them. We still are connected to them today. We still, we all go to the same church. Um, I love them for sure. They told us, they didn't say, no, don't get married. They just said, not yet. And we said, nope, we're going to do it anyway. What? <laughs> Yeah, we did. We did do three marital counseling. I think it was like eight weeks or something like that uh, with our church. If I would have known better, I would have also done like uh, professional like therapy type stuff too. Yeah, I believe they go hand in hand. I think they can work, uh, especially even just the individual piece. Getting that individual therapy for yourself and then doing the, the, the therapy as a a couple or the premarital counseling i think that i think it makes the the perfect sandwich you know yeah for sure at what point did you know there was trouble in paradise oh from the beginning <laughs> from the beginning from the very start <laughs> um there so again a part of this christian ethic is that you do certain things you don't do certain things you stay away from certain things and you engage in certain things when I met him, he was very new to Christianity as a whole and even new were to the uh, denomination, I guess you would call it, that I was a part of in the set of theological conviction. But me having grown up in that since I was a little girl, I'm just going, going deeper and deeper into it, I was at a period in my life where I was trying to figure out how much of it I should keep and how much of it was not valuable for me as a Black woman um, who believes in Jesus. And so one of the things that I was huge on uh, were communicated boundaries, right? I definitely had moments where I would cross my own boundaries or allow people to cross my boundaries. But the overwhelming majority of the time, I did not date dudes that I had no like I had not I had not had a boyfriend in all of college or high school for that matter. Uh, with the exception of one boy I dated for like two months, freshman year of high school. We don't count. <laughs> um, so a serious committed relationship I had not ever done before because my entire ideology was such that if he's not a Christian and he's not the type of Christian that I am, he's not a black man, and he's not, you know, he there's no there's no use in wasting my time. So the whole, you know, dating thing, I would go out with guys, but I wouldn't even qualify that as dating because in my mind, dating meant that I'm trying to get to know you with the intention of being in a relationship. If I have no intention of doing that, then we're just friends going out to eat. Uh, and so didn't talk to boys on the phone after a certain time. If we were to date, you had to know that I'm not, I, my goal back then was to not kiss into a marriage, mm -hmm. right? I don't do any of that especially because I knew myself sexually in my own mind and I knew my limits. And so we met July, August 
of 2012, these boundaries were clearly communicated to him um, multiple times. And as of some men, not all men, a man do it. But as it felt like a constant check in of just a little bit. Can I try? Can we? I don't understand. I thought you. So that was like one, right? Mm-hmm. And then uh, him going through my journal, which uh, his side of the story is he had never dated a girl with a journal before, so he didn't know what it was when he was reading. Mm. I don't see how that would stand up in court. <laughs> like, like I, thought, I, just I don't understand if that was a good defense, but whatever. Um, and then the Christmas time, around that time when I, when I was finishing up praying about whether I should be with him, I asked him to come meet my mom because he had never met my mom at that point. And family and community is, was and is very important to me. Like my mother has met every person is actually like in my life she's at least met them and any any dude who's been seriously interested in me my mama has to vet them um or at least like you know i just i I believe i believe that my family has spiritual gifts that i need in my life to hold me accountable um and so yeah i asked him to come meet her and i i don't know if he was embarrassed to tell me that he didn't have no gas in his car or if he truly believed it, but his response was, uh, I don't think that's necessary or you know, it's not. That's, you know, you basically like I'm doing too much. And in my mind, I'm like, but you plan you're going to be in a relationship with me and you know within our ethic what that means and what that leads to. So why wouldn't you want to see the community that I come from? Because that's going to matter down the road. That matters now, but it matters even more down the road that, that you're trying to initiate. Mm-hmm. Um, his story now more focuses on the fact that he didn't have gas in his car, but his story back then was more focused on he thought I was doing too much because, you know, that he grew up a player doing his thing. Uh, girls he dated, he could they couldn't even bring because he dated a couple Christian girls before me that were way more like they was coaching. I ain't coaching. <laughs> So, you know, they they couldn't bring him home. Mm-hmm. Uh, I could and had to. Uh, but I, I don't think he understood the gravity of that. Uh, and I held that against him for a long time. And I think there was some, I had some reason to. But I just took it as him not taking me or what he wanted seriously. Like, I just thought he was playing with me. Mm-hmm. I understand. It was a lot of them. It was like there was a lot of them. I can go down a list. <laughs> um, and I'm sure there was some for me too. Um, I remember there was a moment where he asked me, essentially, was there anybody else that was occupying my time? And I told him no. But in my mind, a name popped up. Um, and I wrote about it in my journal, and that's how he found out about it. Uh was so he felt deceived. Because even though I told him no, there was a person who, you know, might have been pers- now in reality, this person was not pursuing. This person never expressed any intentions on pursuing. Did did me and this person have a very deep relationship? Like were we basically best friends? Absolutely. <laughs> um and could that potentially have posed a threat? Not in the way that he probably thought it would, because it didn't. Um, but I was still working out that in my mind as well. And since that person had never communicated any intention to pursue me, when he asked that question, my honesty was, there's nobody out here who's a threat to what you're trying to do. Mm. Um, so yeah, um, not to minimize, I guess I could have been more clear about the the reality of that relationship. So I don't want to minimize him feeling deceived. Um, I just think that there could have been some uh, some some better communication conversation around that question. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm not sure if this is a red flag, but it was a red flag for him that on our first date I rubbed his back. Uh, such a red flag that he reached out to mutual friends about it and asked basically if I was a 
a, a bus down because I gave him a back rub publicly in the public, out in the in the public. Oh wow! You know, <laughs> so that would be a red flag on my part too. Because why don't you come to somebody else to ask about my sexual history? Because I gave you a back rub. That's weird, but you know, whatever. Like it was trouble from the beginning. It was a hard pass. It should have been a hard pass, or at least a not now. Yeah. Not not today. I respect that. So, well, I guess because the next question I was going to ask, like, is there anything that you could have done to keep your marriage or what have you could have done differently considering what you what you know now? I could have done a lot different. I, I could have done a lot different. Uh, Starting with being more honest. I never had an issue being honest with myself. Um, that's what my journal was for. Um, even as a little girl, I've been journaling since I could write. Uh, that's just been a lifelong practice of mine. And my journal was always my safe space to let everything out, right? And to be as mean, as angry, or as hurt, or as ashamed as as I felt. Uh, and there have been spaces in my life where friendships, relationships in my life, where I could also show up as that full person. But it takes time for a person to earn that right to see all of me. Um, and when I give those parts of myself with a person having not earned that, I betray myself. So like my mom would read my journal growing up, which made me feel like she was in a safe space because she did not respect boundaries. Because not only did she read it, but then she would weaponize it against me. And it's like, well, that wasn't your business to begin with. So you can't go, you can't, that's not fair. Because the way I might bring it to you might be more respectful and gracious than the way I might say it in my journal. The issue might be real. But at least in my journal, I can just be, feel my feelings without shame. That's not for you. With my partner having done that so early in the relationship and doing it multiple times throughout, journal, phone, email, I'm talking about sur- full, full, full circular surveillance of my life. I felt trespassed. And despite me feeling like that, I would. Holding on to this hope, holding on to this belief, you know, remains there. And I had a choice to make, right? Because if you're going to be with the person who believes that they should have unlimited access to all that you are, um, then you have to decide for yourself if that's something that you can give, if that's something you feel safe to give, if that's something that you can give. And then when you do make that decision, aka when I married you, all the stuff that you did before the marriage that made me feel trespassed, I should have just been like, forget that. He is the jerk, right? That's ideally how that should have worked. I think in reality, it's obvious that it couldn't work like that, <laughs> which meant I should have been, I should have not did, <laughs> I should have not pursued the relationship. But again, like I said, if that's what you, if, if, I'm, if I'm agreeing to be with you, I'm agreeing to the life that we're creating together. And so honesty and trans- full transparency and vulnerability should be a part of that. And I wasn't as honest and as uh, transparent and as vulnerable as I should have been as a wife and as a partner. Yeah. Um, I definitely... Uh, so no, yeah, that's just one major thing. Yeah. No, I was going to say, but hearing what you're saying, I can understand from just from the past, like the way you felt about vulnerability, you know, you it would make you, you know, clam up considering that, you know, if your mom went through, you, you know what I'm saying, your journal kind of thing. So I can, I can understand that. And a lot of times I tell people, especially when you're married or in a long-term relationship, you can't have the a healthy relationship without the vulnerability. And you have to know their backstory. If if you don't know their family of origin or their backstory, it's gonna cause a lot of issues because you're wondering why is this person acting like this? Why are they behaving like this? And, uh, and then some people won't even open up to you because they just feel like they can't trust you. For sure, mm-hmm. for sure. I think and it, and it happens on both sides. I think men struggle with it just like women do. Um, I don't want it to be thrown up in my face. I don't want to be judged. I don't want to feel shame. So um, a lot of times in relationships, we can show up 
as a as a facade of ourselves. Uh, and I don't care who you are, what you say. I don't care how long y'all live together, how long y'all been boyfriend and girlfriend. And once you're married, it's like something clicks and the ugliest of ugly comes out of us. And now we're all of a sudden wondering, well, what does this come from? Because we weren't having those hard conversations in the relationship because we weren't traversing through hard moments with our person. Like if I'm in a relationship with somebody, I expect them to see what it looks like when I'm with my mom who is physically handicapped and has these different emotional and mental and physical struggles and how I as a person had to deal with that since I was born because my mother's been handicapped her whole life. Therefore, she's been handicapped my whole life. And you have to stop for yourself. Is this something that I can navigate with this person? Like that's, that's, that matters because that, that helps you understand how I feel about control. That helps you understand how I feel about needing help, wanting help, asking for help. That helps you understand how I feel about, I'm the oldest girl. That makes you feel, understand what I feel about responsibilities. Um, and it even helps you understand what I, how I feel about family. Um, and yeah, these, these values and these ethics come up in marriage in ways that they can't come up in relationships because there is no, you know, obligation there. Um, there's no commitment for real. Yeah. So, yeah, those hard conversations have to happen beforehand and that reflection has to happen beforehand and then increasingly so in the marriage. But if you're not doing it before, if y'all just having fun and kicking in and doing what you do, and we just having a good time and y'all not going through the muck and mire together as the relationship progresses, it's, it's going to be a it's gonna be a tough situation when you get married. Yeah, that's real. I, I don't think I understood that. enough about his background. His, I, I knew some of it, mm-hmm. but I, I don't think I knew enough either. And I think there were choices on both of our parts to try to protect each other from that in ways that we probably should have, should it, should not have, and protect ourselves from being judged because of that in ways that we shouldn't have tried to protect ourselves. From. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. How? What did you do to heal? from your divorce mm. that's a, such a multi-layered question because i was literally just talking to one of my mentors i call him my dad uh but he's not my physical like biological father he's my best friend and i was telling him like about this healing journey that i'm still on and all of the choices that i've made along the way that some people my ex included, might call demonic, right? The uh, it, it, For me, it has really been an emphasis on living out my values, which at the core of how I want to live my life, I need a lot of autonomy. I need a lot of freedom. Um, I, yeah, I need a lot of autonomy. I need a lot of freedom. And it's less about control for me and it's more about understanding, right? I can be, as long as I know what's going on, I can be completely hands off and I can just show up and have a good time and eat X, Y, and Z. Um, and so taking taking time, right? taking my time to do whatever it is that I want, however I want to do it and deciding for myself, is this a part of who I am? Is this something that, is being offered to me, you know, uh, uh, by society, by the Christian culture that I inherited, evangelicism and all that. My background, my, by the way, my mom and my grandma told me to do things, or is it authentically aligned with what makes me feel good, right? Like self date nights. I love being by myself. I am a introvert's introvert of the introvert. <laughs> I love being by myself and I love new experiences. And I am not one of those people who's afraid to do things by myself, do things, go places. I do not. I prefer it. I prefer it. Um, sure. I love my friends and I love spending time with my friends. I love having experiences with my friends. Leave me alone. Everybody can leave me alone. <laughs> so taking myself on these date nights has been healing for me because we didn't date a lot in my marriage. We barely dated before. We spent far more time arguing and walking on eggshells than we did 
growing in love, both in the relationship and in the marriage. And so now, and I spent my entire 20s that way. And like I told you, I grew up in this ethic where you don't date if you're not looking for marriage. So self-dating has allowed me to romance myself and to feel my body, feel my mind, feel my heart, and ask myself questions and do things that I'm afraid to do, not because somebody else is walking with you and pushing towards it, but because it's something that I believe in and it's authentic. Um, so, you know, the freedom to create, you know, be a social media influencer, something that was not encouraged in my partnership or supported in the way that I need to support it. Um, and definitely would probably would not have been supported if I was still aligned with the culture of my, uh, of evangelicism, like I was back then, um, the way that I show up now on the internet. It has been freeing because I really have never cared what anybody says. And now I really don't have to because who's going to check me? Not my husband. Who's going to check me? Who? 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 I'm grown. It's my fault. Like, if I want to take, or even help besides social media, if I want to take naked pictures of my phone just for me to look at. Nobody's going through my phone anymore <laughs> and being like, who you sending these to? Who was these for? For me? Why you ain't send them to me? Because they yo, because I'm your person. Because they were for me. My body. It's mine. My body is for me. <laughs> my body is for me first. <laughs> it's my body that I love, that I enjoy. That I have the freedom and autonomy to dress and wear and and yes. So yeah, recovering my values and then living my life according to those values and reflecting and changing, making different choices when I find that I'm not living according to those values. No. That has I, been super powerful in my healing journey. That's 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 beautiful. I wanted to ask because I. I have some other questions to ask, but this isn't even in my notes. I wanted to ask you about how do you feel about should you pursue your purpose before marriage or do you think it's better to have someone that can help support you? Like you get married and then you like both. What? <laughs> both? And I, so, so essentially the first, right? Because and it's hard. It's hard because, I, you know, when I went to co- you go to college and you're 18 and you pick a major and you think you have a career in mind of what you want to do. And not only just a career, you have a life that you have built in your mind. This is where I want to live. This is what I do want to do in my community. This is what I want to do in my faith community. This is what I want to do. You know, this I want this many children. This is what I want to produce. When I lay on my dying bed, this is the legacy that I want to leave behind. And this is the work that I'm doing when I'm 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 20, to build towards that future. That is not stagnant. As you learn more, as you discover more, that the purpose doesn't change, but the methods by which we reach that purpose and even the audience who benefits from that shifts. And then you bring on this whole other person who you are now accountable to and they're accountable to you. And I believe, I believe with my whole heart that it is in your best interest to choose somebody who aligns with that purpose, right? So like, I before I became a teacher, before I went to college, my plan was to become an attorney. And I wanted to do stuff in education and curriculum and, you know, that kind of thing. Um, but I wanted to be in the political sphere um, as an attorney. Then I decided... Somewhere along the way, maybe attorney later, teacher now. But then I met the attorney and I said, huh, well, would you look at that? This boy who I find very attractive and who loves the Lord, like I love the Lord, is also in law school. <laughs> so maybe he can be the attorney <laughs> and I can be the teacher. Or at least if I become the attorney, I have somebody who's already tra- traversed that road. And to support me and understand, you know, all those kinds of things. And at the very least, if I never become a lawyer, I can still have some of the language and understanding to still do whatever it is that I'm meant to do with this 
however God intends for me to do it, but I'm doing it with this person. And because I know that I'm community minded, right? My relationship wasn't all bad. We used to talk about opening the first black, the, the, the first black owned Chick-fil-A on the South side of Chicago. That was one of our life, life goals as a couple yeah. because we wanted to employ black people, black kids in the neighborhood, give Chick-fil-A level service in one of them, in, in a place where you might get shot outside. You know what I'm saying? But let the Chick-fil-A level service change the tone of the neighborhood, right? Um, and he wanted to open a gym, a, a, a gym, um, a nice gym um, that was very similar to the gym he went to in Nashville. And I wanted to support him in that effort because it's like we were so community minded. How can we come back to Chicago and be black in Chicago and elevate our people with the resources that we have, our mental, financial, relational resources? Like that was literally so it was so embedded into us as individuals that it just made so much sense for us to do that together. Yeah. I remember when his mom first asked me, like, why you want to be with my son? I said, I see his vision and I want to support him. That. I want to be a part of that. I want in on that because that's a part of what I want out of life too, and what I want to do for my city and even our children. Right. So we got pregnant very soon after meeting each other. We met in 2012. We was pregnant in January 2013. Uh-huh. And so at this time, it's like, well, we already got kids. What type of lifestyle do we want to build for our kids? And everything is the one thing we don't ever argue about is our kids. We agree on everything from screen time to life goals to boundaries, all these things. And so it's like, bro, it just makes so much sense. I feel like if you find your purpose, if you know your purpose, or at least have an idea of what it is before, you are going to be better prepared to choose a partner. Otherwise, you risk the, the you risk facing your purpose in your partner. And now, if your partner doesn't have direction, if your partner isn't a good leader, or if your partner messes up or whatever, now you feel lost. You feel discombobulated. You feel like you don't know what you're doing in life. Mm -hmm. It's not supposed to be like that. Like, yeah. I should be able to kind of pull us back to center as a missional family. Mm -hmm. um, I, people always talk about like that word submission being under one mission, right? And I think that there is like a lot of credibility to that. Like, this is what we're doing. This is what I this is what God has called me to do. Whether you exist or not, I'm supposed to do it. Whether I exist or not, you're supposed to do that. But God was so gracious to put us together so we can do it better together. Mm -hmm. I agree. That's good. Yeah, because I just had um, one of the news reporters from uh, NBC, Allison Finch. We were talking about that a couple of weeks ago, and we just continued to talk about it. I was just like, I'm so passionate about that because I think sometimes people can possibly miss out on their purpose messing around with the wrong person um, for sure you know so, thousand percent. yeah so that's a that's an episode within itself <laughs> what three ingredients every marriage needs to be successful Ooh. if sabrina was making the cake give me your three ingredients that's going to make the cake taste really good Intimacy in all its forms. Now, let me put a pin there real quick. Because people look at intimacy in different ways. So give me. I need all of them. All, every different way that every, people talk about, I need all of them. Every single last way. Okay. All of them. All of them. All of them. All of them. All right. <laughs> like, okay. That's a good definition. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm saying, like, I feel like we keep doing ourselves a disservice by limiting intimacy is only sex. Intimacy is only spending time together. Like, no, I need to know you. And I need to be known by you. I know you've heard it before, like the whole in, into me see. I need you to say, everybody do that. If, if you haven't been to church and, been a, and, and, and heard of marriage, sir. Into me, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's yeah, you, you heard it. Into me, you see, yeah, that whole thing. I, you know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. but, but like, like when the Bible in Genesis describes sex, Adam knew his wife. And then you got the whole internet, like, why y'all be crying when y'all get down? Because you understand how beautiful it is when somebody ain't just in your body, they in your soul, they in your spirit. Y'all are connecting. This is a spiritual act. 
But also when I'm just with you and I just smell you, you just make me feel like home. Okay. When you see that when you see me standing there on the on the fringe of a panic attack and your touch grounds me, you're able to show up for me in ways that I can't even show up for myself, in ways that I don't even know to show up for myself in that moment. Um, when we are practicing vulnerability and honesty, when I'm telling you my deepest fears and my deepest and my ugliest sins, and I'm being met there with grace, and I'm meeting you there with grace when you share those things, all of that is intimacy. All of it. I need all of it. All of it. Um, no, that's beautiful. That's 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 some that's some intimacy right there. <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah. I need all that. Um, but I definitely think intimacy is number one. Honor is number two. Mm. Um, I think respect is a part of honor, but honor doesn't always come with respect. Um, I think sometimes respect can have fear attached to it, but I don't think honor ever has fear. True honor ever has fear attached to it. Um, it has a type of respect that says you are so high to me that I couldn't even think of defaming you in public or in private. That every single thing that you do, I'm going to try my best to uplift it into thick high, to assume the best about you at all times, to assume that you're not out here to hurt me, to assume that you have the best intention, to assume that whatever it is you did, however much you spent, whatever it is, whatever decision that you are making and that we are making, you have your best and our best in mind at all times. I, you are, I don't want to, I don't want to mix it with idolatry. Yeah, yeah, for sure. But like, I just want, I just, you got to think of your partner like, oh my God, that's just so above the rest. Period. Like, what? Who else? Be, they should be on the honor roll, the beans list of your life. Straight A's across the board at all times. Hey. Um, so intimacy, being close, honor, thinking highly of one another and behaving according to that, that ethic. Um, and if we're talking about marriage, if we're talking about marriage, I'm just going to use commitment as a, as a blanket term because it has to be both a commitment to your own self, being a commitment to being your best self, a commitment to loving even when you don't feel like it, a commitment to growing and healing even when you feel like this is too hard. And then also, of course, the commitment to that person, commitment to intimacy, even when you don't feel like being intimate. A commitment to honoring them when you don't when when you feel like they've done things that are dishonored. Um, a commitment to the relationship as a system, as an institution, as something that is that is created or ordained by God it has a purpose that is beyond y'all. That includes y'all for sure, but it is so much beyond y'all. Um, a commitment to God um, and, and what He says about marriage. A commitment to I got to be committed to your family, the family that you come with. You got to be committed to mine. It's just commitment overall. Like, I really, as, even as somebody who is, um, you know, in the throes of divorce, mm -hmm. I really just feel like that, sh that word should be so, so far out of the lexicon of our language. Like, barring abuse, I just feel like ain't, it's, it's, it's very little that we can't work out with time. One, a church that me and my ex were a part of in the early years of our marriage, the one of the, I guess the mantra, or the, the, the formula for them was gospel plus safety plus time. And I just felt like that was such a simple formula for how we do community, how we do all relationships by prioritizing God's truth, by uh, being humble enough and open enough and vulnerable enough to create a safe space for one another to be broken. And then by giving it time, by not putting anybody on our timer for when they should be better, on our timer for when they should grow, but truly being like, we literally, you're saved, I'm saved. He's going to come back one day. That's what I expect perfection. Right now, I just expect a commitment to the God, to the gospel, and continuing to create safety for one another. We got the rest of our lives to do that and to get better at it. Yeah. Um, so yeah, commitment, commitment, intimacy, and uh, honor. That's beautiful. 
because my uh, my wife and I we start well my mentor and I we used to do this together and I started to implement this into our marriage where um for 30 days we, we you know of course we have our own little personal bible study but for 30 days we're going to read one book of the bible 30 days just every day if you just read a chapter a day every day for 30 days and every so many days you know what do you feel like God is saying to you in this book you know or what do you feel like he's saying to you in this chapter just sparking that conversation that intimacy you know where you feel like God is speaking to you right now and just the revelations that you get just from constantly reading the same book every day for 30 days and you almost kind of feel like a little scholar you know what I'm saying but it just draws that conversation like where do you feel like God is leading you how do you feel like God is transforming you just little simple stuff like that that can really have you thinking like this is this is life changing it's and it really and it's it's crazy because it's so multi-layered in this moment. I'm learning from you. I'm being inspired by you. I'm being challenged by you. The Lord is working through you to speak to me. And I'm also watching the Lord work in you, which is just, I'm so grateful to God that you are coming to these conclusions that when, when we encounter hardship, whether it's internal in our relationship or external, you are, I'm watching you lean on the things that God has recently revealed to you. You're watching me and we're using the, God, the ways God is speaking to us together in order to solve these issues. And then like at the end of the day, while you're talking as my man, I'm just like, oh, he's so fast. I'm talking about Jesus. Ooh, that's, that's sexy. I don't care what nobody said. And you don't have to feel bad about feeling like that because that's my man. <laughs> it's God's man for me. <laughs> like, yes. It's not weird. It's not inappropriate. This is how it's supposed to go. <laughs> so... All of that, like that, that is so, it's a beautiful picture of what God intended for intimacy to be. It is this total, it, like I was talking about, just that total vulnerability, like, man. Yeah. And when, and when you have it, nobody can take it away from you. It's, it's mm-hmm. there. You just, it just makes your bonds that much stronger. I think a lot of relationships are. Missing intimacy. Uh, I was doing a, a recording earlier today uh, with the therapist, and she was on part two of Life After Divorce. So this is my second one of the day. We talked about if couples can grow apart, then where, like, where do we go wrong? Is it that we didn't have a vision because we should have been headed somewhere? To say that we grew apart mean that we should have been going somewhere. So where are we going? So if you don't have that direction in your marriage, it's easy to grow apart because there's no direction. Everybody's just doing their own thing. And I thought that was interesting because it's easy to grow apart. Very easy. And that's why it's important to have that one goal, one mission. Uh, even having a mission statement, have a mission statement in our house. Yes. You know, so I love that. Yeah. And, we tried and, and, to recreate, create one. It never happened, but we yeah. tried. <laughs> yeah. And, and and it's all good. You know, uh, you know, love God, serve people, create dope memories. This is something real simple. And um, if it doesn't align with that, then we shouldn't be doing it. Right. So that's the one for sure. Yeah. But I, and I love that. Love God, serve people, create dope memories. It's, it lets us know what you prioritize. In your relationship and as people for your children. Um, like we had, we was trying to create this family crest that we was gonna have at the entrance of our door. Like we was, it was we was we was doing too much. But um, you know, of course, faith and community education is really huge for us as a, a big book family. X has hundreds of books. I have hundreds of books, over a thousand. Um, our, each of our kids has a personal library of over four hundred books. We real big on books in my house. So you know, education, faith, community is one other thing. I don't remember. I think it might have been like blackness or Africanness. Um, but yeah, uh, that mission, I think like what you said is so important. It's harder to grow apart when y'all are going towards the same goal. Y'all want the same things out of life. Um, and if that's established before y'all get together, then everything that you're doing as a couple 
is going towards that versus this. We, you know, we together because we like it and we like being here, and this is just who I want to spend the rest of my life with. Spend the rest of your life with doing what? What about what was you trying to do in your life that that you can now do better with this person that you, you know what I'm saying? Like, mm-hmm. how will you carry on the legacy if that person passes away? And will you know that person enough and have built a foundation with that person enough to know that even if they move on, pass away, or whatever, or become sick or whatever it is, and they they can't uphold their part of the legacy before? Can you do it in their name? Mm-hmm. Right? You may not even do it the way that they would have wanted to. But if this was y'all mission as a family, that don't stop. That don't that don't stop. Yeah. Um that's, that's, and so yeah, like I, I just think, yeah. I, I think it's uh it's hard. It's it's hard. And in our world today we're so focused, increasingly focused on individual, my happiness, my joy, my peace. If this person don't bring me peace, if this person don't bring me joy, all of that is valid. You definitely don't want to invite people in your life who are coming to destroy you or who don't or who don't care whether or not they destroy you, even if they're not coming with that intention. They're not willing to shift the, their, their habits in order to maintain a relationship with you in the best of ways. Mm-hmm. Don't invite that. Mm-hmm. But if that's all you're focusing on, baby, you're missing out on a whole world of you and of life. Yeah. Uh, and as a black person, as a you know, as a descendant of Africa, we don't just think of ourselves in this time period. We think of everybody who came before us and everybody who is to come. Yeah. How do I honor the people before me? How do I prepare the way for the people after me? Um, the the former pastor and first lady of the church that me and my ex attended, their their family mantra is to the tenth generation. Everything that they're doing, they're thinking about how do my people. 10 generations from now mm. benefit and how are they impacted by the choices we make as individuals, but more importantly, by the choice that we make as a couple, as a, as a, as a matriarch and patriarch of this line. Um, I just think that's so beautiful. I think it's so beautiful. Like I think all the time about like, dang, I'm going to be a young grandma too, because I had my, all my kids before I was 25. So, um, I'm going to probably be like 47 with five free kids. I'm so jealous because <laughs> and I'm like, I'm gonna be in the streets a little bit, but I'm also gonna be doing hair and popping up at school and doing homework with grandkids and crocheting outfits. But we're gonna be out of town, fucking with my wine. See, I'm so jealous because I I had kids late. Like I have a three-year-old and I'm 46. <laughs> So just keep That's me. That's not funny. Uh, I'm so, yeah. I'm gonna keep you in my prayers. I Thank mean you. Yeah, keep pray for me that uh yeah. no more for me. Uh, anybody who come up, yeah, they be like, You want kids? I'll be like, Do you want kids? Like, what can you get out my face? Oh no, Man. I'm done. Oh no, yeah, yeah. I I'm I'm a little late, but I'm done done. Like <laughs> I was yeah, my my wife was like, one or two things gonna happen, either I'm you gonna get a vasectomy or I'm gonna get my tie, my tooth, something's gonna happen. And I had to be the sacrificial lamb. So I said, you know what? And that's I'm the sure. right way to do it. And I agree. Cause that's a that's a, and I tell men this too, and it's just so off subject, but just real quick since we're here, any man that's listening, if you are going through that dilemma, because there are some men that's like, I'm kind of debating, I don't know. You know, if she had your child, the least you can do is go get cut. That's my piece of advice for today. Uh, yeah, just yeah, just fifteen minutes. You in and out. Uh, yeah, pain is there, like there. You know what I'm saying recovery, higher success rate, undoable if you change. Yeah, stop yeah. playing with me. Stop yeah. playing with me, sir. Right, you know, so her hormones won't be all over the place because she got to take birth control and all this other stuff. Just go ahead and get it done. You will live, and That's I promise cool. you, everything works the same. Yep, I'm an advocate <laughs> of it. I always tell guys, I'm an advocate of it. They should, somebody should give me a sponsorship commercial or something where I'm just like, vasectomies for men. But anyway, I'm just all off track. What advice would you give to singles who desire to marry? Don't um no uh no and I I'm I'm joking but I'm a little bit serious because I made a post a couple months ago like Paul was 
he was he didn't lie, guys. When he talked about um, how marriage changes our focus from the things of God to how to love and serve our partner, our, your priorities have to shift in some degree once you get married. And you really, really, truly need to ask yourself, why do I want to be married? What what is is this really for me? I knew before I got married. I didn't I never I never required it. I would have never cared if I never got married. And so that should have been an indicator for me that it's not something that I should seriously pursue because it's easy to have the mentality like I don't need you anyway when you really feel like I didn't want to be in this. Right? Like I if you just, I have friends. I value companionship like everybody else. And my friends felt like enough for me. Still do. You know? Um, of course, the Bible is very clear about you know, our physical desires. And if it's that, you know, it's better to marry than to burn. It's as clear as day. Right. Right. But I also think some of our sexuality is a part of the product of culture and society. And if we remove some of those influences, how. Like, I think you, I think more of us will be okay. Like, I feel like most of, more of us will be. It's a feeling, just like hunger, just like thirst, that comes and goes. And unlike hunger and thirst, which if you mm-hmm. don't satisfy that feeling after a while, you will die. Mm-hmm. If you don't satisfy this one, you ain't gonna die. But did you die? You die. You're, you're not gonna die. <laughs> you're not gonna die. Did you die? I'm not gonna die. <laughs> and so it's like part of me is very much like really truly examine yourself. Marriage is not required to look for your life. Marriage is not required to build a strong family. I highly suggest getting married if you want to have kids. However, mentoring other people's kids, being a great auntie and uncle, uh, being a, a mentor and fathering and mothering the fatherless and motherless. We need that too, and that's harder to do when you marry to get your own kids. Yeah, that's. <laughs> and so, if I was, you know, still single and childless, me being a teacher would look incredibly different because that's my job to show up for kids in this certain way. Yeah. But I say every day, I'm not sacrificing my own personal children to help your kid. <laughs> that's right. My kids always gonna come first. <laughs> Without question. Yeah. And I love true. my students. I love them. Of course. But I could show up for them more if I didn't have to show up for my own kids. You preach. Um, and so uh, the way that we show up for one another as singles, as brothers and sisters in the faith, it's just, I just, I just really think that singleness is not honored in a way that it should be and given the same level of purpose and meaning as marriage is. And that's a, that's a terrible mistake of the of the church specifically, but society as a whole. It don't matter if you're a Christian or not. In a lot of different cultures, it's like, get married, get married, get married. Why are you not married? You're a spinster. Why are you? Yeah. Well, have kids, have kids, have kids. Shut up. Get away from me. Well, would People you die having kids? That's true. No thanks. Well, would you say that a lot of singles are unhappy because they don't know their purpose? Is that a fair assessment? Because they don't know their purpose and because, again, society makes us think that having these types of relationships is like, okay, for instance, I have a male best friend. He's been my best friend since freshman year of high school. Love that man to death. You hear me? If he called me right now and be like, Sabrina, I want some macaroni and cheese, I'll figure out a, a day and a way to get him this macaroni and cheese. After this man is married. Yes, after this interview. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, and and I'm I'm obviously exaggerating a little bit, but the, the point is I've I've slept next to this man for the clothes, of course. But I've slept next to this man, I've traveled with this man. Uh he knows me. He knows me. I have conversations with him like one of the girls. He has conversations with me like one of the guys. And we've always been this way. 
He's rescued me from situations that I shouldn't have been in. He showed up for me in a myriad of ways. And we are not related. If he was my blood brother, people would say, oh, that makes sense. But since he's not, people always try to make it seem like, oh, y'all are supposed to be in a relationship. Why are y'all not in a relationship? Why are y'all not in a relationship? Because I don't like him like that. Because he don't like me like that. Because that's weird. Like, that's not his purpose. That's not our purpose in being in this in relationship with one another. And now I get the privilege of also loving his wife well. Because she's now a close friend of mine, closer than he is these days. And so and she knows that she can trust him with me. So when I went out of town with him a few months ago to a poetry slam and she wasn't there, we all slept in the same air and B and B. I remember I don't, it was one of them girls. It might have been Kiki. If somebody was like, My girl ain't, ain't no woman coming up in my house with my man. It was like, I'm literally out of town with my friend, man. Do you think she was worried about me being all up on him? Absolutely not. Like, weird. It's weird. So I think if we understood that you can't, my partner is all of the things that I described to my best friend, but I also am sexually attracted to this person. And I also I also want to be a part of whatever this person is building in life. And I want them to be a part of whatever I'm building in life. I want to be, I want to create mission and purpose in life with this person. That's my part. My best friend is my friend who I'm very close to. And we can sit and eat Cheerios and watch TV. And I can go to his baseball game and I hate baseball. I'm not gonna say I hate baseball. I just don't enjoy it. I, I wouldn't it. enjoy it without him. I and I can wear his jersey. He can teach me different things and we can enjoy each other. And that's it. We can be done. Mm-hmm. I think if we have more fulfilling co-ed friendships, there would not be as many stupid marriages because you would, because in your mind would be like, at the very least, I can get respect and love and protection and provision from my guy friend who ain't getting enough for me. You think because you took me on a date two times, you're supposed to, I'm, you're supposed to be my man now? Nah. <laughs> no, that's real. I want to ask you this last question before we go. There's no right or wrong answer. Who makes a better spouse? Someone married for the first time or someone who's remarried? Um, a better spouse for home. <laughs> because <laughs> I don't know if I want to be with somebody who ain't been married before or who ain't who ain't been in a long term relationship at the very least. Mm. But that's because I've been married before. Mm. Um, and I don't want to always feel like I'm teaching you stuff, and I don't want you to think that I'm comparing you to your person because you would have the empathy to know that just as much as you're not comparing me to your ex, I'm not comparing you to mine. Mm-hmm. However, I think the way that marriage was designed by God meant for us to do this thing with one person forever and I think one of the reasons for that is because the two become one I am supposed to in this union be fashioned for you I was wife material before I got here I was a great one before I got here how do I then become your wife which is easier to do with somebody who's never been anybody else's wife Versus this is how I showed up as a wife or a husband in the past. This is what I learned about being a life wife or a husband. These were the mistakes I made in my past relationship. And I don't want to make those same mistakes again. Well, 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 hold on, hold on, hold on. Before you say this is a mistake, maybe it just didn't work for that person. Maybe I need that over here. And you are even, you haven't even tried yet because you think you know better because you, you already been there done it. So it's supposed to be, I think it's supposed to be a molding of each other, that intimacy, that commitment, that honor says that I don't see nobody else but you. You are my only point of reference. And therefore, there's no way you couldn't truly satisfy me because you are all I know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. On the flip side of that, (laughs) though. I mean, I'm, and, and the statistics are clear, you know, second and third marriages typically don't last in the way that first marriages do, which they them, they barely last. But at least they last more than second and third. Second and third, right. <laughs> you know, so I think that that data is very clear in of itself. I, I think the reasons of that are, are many, but 
I do think there are there is something to be said of people who have walked this journey before and learned about themselves. Mm-hmm. This is what I need. This is what I don't need. This is what I value. This is what I don't value. And this is what I'm going to look out for in my next relationship. Um, versus a person who's never been married before, in my case, never been in a relationship before, so not really having a full scope of what I should prioritize in a partner. And a lifelong partner at that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Oh, man, this has been so good. Uh, as always, you never disappoint. So <laughs> there's so many other questions I, I want to ask, but I was, I know. I was just because there's stuff that you were saying. I'm just like, eh, so I'll just <laughs> I'll be hitting you up again. Well, look, we don't be back. Okay, I mean, yeah, it's we... always a good time when I'm here, and I love love the, the work that you're doing. Again, I've been watching so much of what you've been putting out on YouTube, and I just think it's such these conversations are so important. So your guests be having y'all be making me. I actually bought a book the other day. I'm gonna um, read it real quick. It's called How to Love a Black Man. When I come back, I'm gonna be smart. Watch Ooh, how to... the book looks so good too. I'm not gonna hold you like it looks so good. I can't wait to read it because it'd be books like that that be about that, and it'd be like this is dumb. Who wrote yeah. this? <laughs> but this one looks like it's like solid mm-hmm. a little bit, you yeah. know. Mm-hmm. So I'm just like, okay, God, teach me, teach mm-hmm. me. Not that yeah. I ever intend on being in love again, but so that I can tell somebody else. <laughs> I was I was gonna ask you that this okay I'm gonna let you go but I was gonna ask you is well you know what I'm gonna save it I'm gonna save it you gonna do that to the people I know you gonna do that right to the people. that's all right but, but this is this is gonna hold them to make sure that they tune in again because you don't miss you're two for two from the field so we got to make sure that the people come back so that way they sure. keep this question. Let everyone know how they can get in touch with you, Sabrina. You can follow me on Instagram and TikTok at she.unapologetic. That's S-H-E dot U-N-A P-O-L-O-G-E-T-I-C. Um, yeah. I'm on the interwebs doing all kinds of things, so you'll find out more about that Yeah, on, on Instagram and TikTok. <laughs> yeah. yeah, right? She got content for days. Brave Arts community, make sure you connect with Sabrina. She's not a stranger. You already know what's up. So make sure you hit the subscribe button. Make sure you share this video with someone in need because Sabrina got bars on bars. As always, if you're listening to this video podcast, make sure you hit the, uh, well, leave a rating and review. We'd love to hear from you. Um, We recently gave away a free Amazon gift card because someone won the drawing. uh, And that was a previous episode. We talked about that last episode. So we'll be up for another one. So make sure you leave a rating and review. We'd love to hear from you. This is Sean with special guests. She unapologetic. (laughs) All right, Brave Hearts community. Take care. Hey, thanks again for watching another segment of It's Scary to Remarry. I have so much more amazing content and some phenomenal guests as well. People who've been through a divorce, people who remarry, people who desire to marry. So much great content. So make sure that you hit one of these videos. It's somewhere around here. But anyway, go watch another video.